Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight with you all. I'm the director of the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, and we've collected what we believe to be the largest data set on urban forestry in the country, potentially in the world. Uh, we've been working very hard on it for about six years now, and uh, we're getting ready to repeat some of the data collection, and it's been very helpful and very informative to us as we work to try to improve the canopy in the Chicago region. And so I'll talk to you a little bit more about that um, as we go through the evening. Uh, the Chicago Region Trees Initiative was founded to improve quality of life for people who live in the Chicago region. So the question, why do we care how many trees we have? Because we know that the benefits trees provide go up with the size of the canopy and the size of the trees, and oftentimes exponentially as the trees grow, uh, they provide many more benefits. So you can't cut down one large 30-inch tree and plant 10 3-inch trees and have the same benefits. It just doesn't work like that. So we really uh, are encouraging people to think about planting and caring for trees, and that's uh, why we've collected this data set. So our data started, uh, our data collection started in 2010 when the Arboretum and the U.S. Forest Service got together and did a census in the Chicago region, and they uh, sampled 2,000 plots across seven counties. Uh, we looked at species diversity, um, structure, size, height, leaf area, index. Um, there's a number of a land use. There were a number of, of uh, items that were collected for this data set. And when the data came back, it told us that we have 157 million trees in the Chicago region. Now, since that census was done, we've lost 13 million trees to emerald ash borer. Anybody know about emerald ash borer? So it's a pretty significant problem for many communities. And uh, what's fascinating about that is that it was a very popular street tree to be planted because it holds up really well. And so it was planted far more prominently on streets and public land, so it was 20%. So almost 20% of all the street trees in the Chicago region have disappeared. Um, our area covers these seven counties. That's where we've collected the data. Uh, it's about 8.4 million people, the Chicago metro area, seven counties, 284 municipalities, and it's actually 175 park districts. 30% um, of all of our trees are a species called buckthorn. Anybody know what buckthorn is? One or two people. It's a, a Eurasian species that came here and doesn't have a predator, so it's it's taking over the world. If you live in Lake County, for instance, it's 42% of all the trees in Lake County, and it's continuing to grow. So it's a big problem for us. When we did the census, we were able, because there's 2,000 plots, um, we're able to identify species and tree and canopy composition across at the county level, but because there were so few plots, we weren't able to do it at the municipal or the plot or the parcel level. And so we ran LIDAR from the seven county uh, metro area. Everybody know what LIDAR is? Most of you guys do. So it's essentially a plane that flies overhead and, and takes uh, measurements using light detection and radar. And it picks up different heights. And it produces point, a point cloud, which is what this is. And so when you look at this, for instance, you can see these fluffy areas here um, are actually trees. And when we sent the LiDAR imagery off to the University of Vermont, Dr. Jarlath O'Neill Dunn at the University of Vermont ran the analysis for us, and he's able to separate the LiDAR imagery into seven different land cover classes for us, which is, enables us to be able to look at individual parcels and tell them what percentage of canopy they have. And uh, we're actually working now to begin to identify species using the LiDAR and the new, new LiDAR that's out gives us about 200 points per meter so that we're able to um, really start to extrapolate information using that, that information. And what it does is it enables us to begin to map where we have canopy in the region. So for instance, the dark blue areas are the, uh, the upper north shore uh, along Lake Michigan, and those tend to be some of the wealthier neighborhoods in the Chicago area. And when you go to the yellow areas, those are where we have lower canopy, and when we look out along the fringe, we know a lot of those areas are agricultural communities. But when you look in these areas, these are not agricultural. They tend to be lower income communities that were industrialized that have lower canopy, who have big percentages of impervious surface, like railroad yards and uh, transportation intermodal uh, areas where they take those big crates off and store them and drop them on trains and other things. So 
um, we know that we have lower canopy in areas where we have fewer resources. So that's something we're very interested in as well. What we've done is we've taken that information and we've put it into packets, what we call our canopy summary packets. And it's on an interactive map, which is on our website. And I put the um, web location here if you're interested in uh, going to it so you can look up your community. Uh, and you can see what uh, your canopy composition looks like. And so we've sorted it out into a, a variety of information sheets for these communities. And it's really more designed for people that want detail because you can see it's very narrative intensive. Um, but what, it, like for instance, this is the village of Dalton, which happens to be a community on the south side of Chicago. And they have a canopy of 26%. The national average for an urban area is 40%. Uh, Chicago overall is about 20% or it was, it's now 18% due to the loss of ash trees. So a community can go on there and take a look at how they, they compare with other communities in the region. So for instance here, and these are all in the canopy packet, there's a whole bunch of tables and graphs that you can look at. Um, we took their canopy and we, looked, we ran it through what's called an iTree model, which is a model that the U.S. Forest Service and the Davy Resource Group developed that starts to extrapolate out the benefits that these trees provide. So for, there's three areas that we've mapped or that we've identified for this community. Uh, carbon sequestered is $43,000 per year. Stormwater is $181,000 per year. And air quality is $617,000 per year. And the reason that that's important for us is because a lot of these municipalities allocate resources based on what they think they're getting back. So if we can start to quantify what these trees are doing for the community. It helps us be able to get money uh, for them to put towards their canopy or to allocate resources to help um, residents. Uh, in addition, in Dalton, which is interesting, um, their canopy is 72% maple, which um, is a real problem for them because we have a bug that's sitting in Ohio called Asian longhorn beetle that loves maple trees and it keeps coming into O'Hare and getting picked up by the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. And once it gets loose here again in the Chicago region, we're going to have a real challenge. And 32% of all the street trees in the Chicago region are maple trees. So if you're planting trees, hold off on maples for a while. That's a problem. We want to have broader species diversity so that when one thing comes through and wipes something out, it doesn't wipe out huge percentages. Like, for instance, in this community, where it would be 72% of all their trees. And then we can, we can put them up against their neighbors. So they can see how they compare with the other communities that are nearby them, which gives them an opportunity to think about how they compare and what they can do to allocate resources again. So when we're looking at species diversity, as I mentioned before, 28% um, of our canopy is buckthorn. 12.4% um, is uh, acer, which is maple. 8.1% is fraxinus, which is ash, which we just lost all of those. Uh, prunus, 6%, and ulmus, 5.2%. And that's for all land use, and it's different across different land uses as to what the composition is, and that's important for us to know because then we can start to provide recommendations to those different landowners about what they can do to improve their canopy and their species diversity. The other thing that we learned with our census was that our native ecosystem, which is oaks, oak ecosystems are native to the Chicago region, and while Illinois is the prairie state, in this area of the state, we had a heavy forest uh, composition here. So when you look at um, what we did is we went back in the, fascinatingly enough, in the 1830s, and some of you may know about this, um, the US government sent surveyors across the United States to survey the land to begin to sell it off. And as they were surveying, they would walk across the U.S. with these chains and they would mark these grid systems off which tend to be townships. And along those lines they would write down what species of trees they saw because they were mark markers or witness trees is what they called them. They would identify the size and the species of them and so we've taken that information and we've layered it with and they're, they're, they wrote up these diaries of uh, listing out what they saw along the way. And We still have copies of those so um, if anybody's interested it's something you can look up online. But one of our scientists at the Morton Arboretum mapped those out for us, and then we layered that with 1939 aerial uh, imagery, and then also, I'm going to go on to the next one here so you can see. This is the 1939 aerial photography that we laid over um, to begin to align where those plots were. And then we layered that, I'm going to go back to this one again. So you can see these are the, the, the trees that were picked up when the surveyors were coming across. 
And the reason we know that oaks were the predominant species of the time is because of their diaries. So everything that's in brown here is an oak tree, and everything that's in orange is a non-oak, which is interesting to see. Um, and what we've done with that, if I've got it on here, I'm going to, I'll wait to tell you about that. So what we've done is we've taken the pre-settlement, the 1830s, 1939, and the 2010, layered that data, and mapped it. So this darker gray or sort of a brown area is where the trees were pre-settlement, and these little green dots are where they are now. So we only have 17% of our oak ecosystems left. 70% of those are on private property and unprotected. And so what we've done is we've begun to um, identify how we can improve the function of those sites by using this mapping. And so the areas that's called a core here are where we have those remnant pre-settlement oaks, which in this instance are these dark blues. And then we've surrounded them by a buffer because it, and I won't go into this tonight, but it, they function much better at a larger size and when they're not fragmented. And so we put buffers around them and oftentimes, again, those could be people's backyards and that's where you guys come into play. And then we provided connectors so that we can provide ways for wildlife to migrate. So that's what we've done with the oak information. Because we know from our census that the majority of our oaks are 18 inches or larger, they're not regenerating and that we've lost most of them. So that's a, a concern for us because we're really focused on trees. So what we've done is we've developed an interactive map so that the different counties, um, and this, this uh, mapping of the oak ecosystems goes from Wisconsin around through Illinois and then into Indiana and over into Michigan. Um, so we have that data. And what we're doing now is we're working with the public landowners, the forest preserve districts, and municipalities and others that own these remnant oak ecosystems and getting them to help us interact and work with private landowners. So that's how we can begin to build um, the oak ecosystems. And so we're using that information combined with the other information and even more that you, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know. So this is what a buffer area looks like. And this is what's on the interactive map. So if you want to zoom in to where you live, or we have oak maps on our canopy summary packets if you go to the interactive map site that I told you about up, up front, the canopy packets. There will be a map for each community in their canopy packet that shows where pre-settlement oaks used to be and where they are now and what's happened to their community since then. So now we knew, uh, our, our data collection was telling us a lot about what we have with respect to canopy, but in order to make change, we have to identify what people are interacting and how they're interacting and who they are and what their resources are. And so what we did is we did what we call our capacity survey. So we sent out surveys to 284 municipalities. We got 174 of them back. We asked them 89 agonizing questions. And um, it was a series of things essentially boiling down to what do you do for the urban forest? What are your resources? What are your skill sets? And how are you incorporating these within your community? And so that helps inform us on, on how we provide outreach, because my job with the Chicago Region Trees Initiative is to take this data and to go out to your community and work with your community to get them to improve their canopy, work with residents to build volunteer base in the community to help support trees, and to see the canopy grow in order to improve quality of life. So what we've done is we've started to map out where we know what we know about capacity in the region to overlay that with our, our canopy information. So for instance, here, is communities that have a management plan. And no is red, gray is we don't know, so those are the ones that didn't send back to us, and yes are those that do have a mass management plan. Whether they have somebody who knows anything about trees on staff, um, how much they're spending per capita on urban forestry, and a whole bunch of operational capacity questions. Then because it's important to us, uh, for, we don't have unlimited resources, we have to be strategic about where we work, um, and so we want to know where, where we need to prioritize our work. And so we've been collecting data on vulnerable populations, temperature, health, heat, air quality, flooding, low canopy capacity, and layering that all together. And what we've done is we've put this in a spreadsheet that we can then go through and start to fiddle around with the data in order to come up with um, who we need to be working with first. And so we've identified, based on that criteria that I just read off to you, priority communities that we need to be working with. 
And we have communities that have 70% canopy down to communities that have 2% canopy. And we are finding a correlation between resources, where communities are under-resourced and have the lower canopies and where they have the greatest need. And we've put this on a story map, which is also on our website, and you can get to it um, from here, our priority map. And it'll, show, it'll go through the different layers with you so you can start to see how it plays out and you can stop it and see how your community, um, what level your community is or what uh, capacity your community has. And it'll begin to help you understand what uh, we're seeing as we go across the Chicago region. So we've got all this data and we've, we're beginning to prioritize it and we're beginning to work with folks to get them to um, implement some of the recommendations that we have. Uh, my office is out of the Morton Arboretum, which is in Lyle, Illinois, and so we have tree scientists or arboriculturalists who focus on uh, how to make trees perform better. We work with social scientists out of the U.S. Forest Service, and we have a variety of partners across the region, and we try to bring them together to help us, help these communities that need assistance. So in this instance, in the village of Dalton, um, they needed a tree inventory because it's hard to manage something that you don't know how much you have or what it is um, and you don't have the resources to do it. So a Ball State University contacted us and said they wanted to do a virtual tree inventory. And so what this involved was using Google Earth and you, go, using Google Street View to see if you could identify tree species just by sitting at your computer and, and following along as Google Street View um, went through the community. And then they followed that up with students from DePaul University who went out to do actual on-the-ground inventories and compared the data to see how it worked out. The end result for us was that we were able to get an inventory for the village of Dalton, which meant that they are now able to understand what their capacity is, and that's how we were able to find out that they had 75% maple in their community. Turns out the virtual tree inventory isn't great, so something to think about. Um, and then we have partners, because the Chicago Region Trees Initiative is a coalition. We have about 200 different organizations that work with us in the Chicago Region. One of our big partners is Open Lands. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they do a lot of work in the Chicago Region. And they have a program called Tree Keepers. And for those of you that want to learn something about how to, to care for trees or to get involved in your community, this is a really great program. It runs four weeks, one, uh, two nights a week, and they have people that come in and talk about different uh, things and train you to, to be a tree keeper in your community. We also have a program that's out of the Morton Arboretum called the Community Tree Champions, where we'll come in and work with your community to increase capacity of volunteers in the community. And why that's important is because in under-resourced communities and even in non-under-resourced communities, they do not utilize their residents. Um, most municipalities do not have any kind of volunteer program with respect to forestry, and it's something that we would like to change. We offer a training on urban forestry basic training. Uh, a fascinating point about this is that we had uh, 35 guys together. It was mostly guys. There were a couple of girls there that uh, we did this training with. And it's all one day of teaching them basic forestry practices, and the second day is chainsaw training. And so we said to them, how many of you run a chainsaw on a regular basis? And they all raised their hands. And we said, how many of you ever been trained? And not one hand went in the air. So if you see somebody cutting down trees on your street, I'd move to the other side. We have a networking program that provides mentoring uh, for communities so that they can mentor each other and share their experience. We've developed a series of templates on how to build a management plan, how to uh, do a community ordinance because your trees are protected based on community regulations and that's where ordinances come in. We get calls from communities all the time and most of them don't have any information on how to select trees so we developed a selector tool where you can go online put in the information that you want. Uh, you want a street tree, you want it to have fall color, spring bloom, you want it to be able to tolerate salt, and you push sand, and it'll give you a list of species to choose from, so you don't have to know as much um, as you used to have to know. Uh, one of our big challenges is getting the nurseries to produce the species we need. They're used to producing a handful of, of species that people like to plant, like maples and ash trees and elm trees and honey locusts. And our maples, or I'm sorry, our ash trees and our elm trees are almost now completely gone. And we're trying to get them to expand diversity, but they're worried about the risk. So we're working with them to uh, do contract growing and increase production. We're trying to build public and private partnerships. So if all of you work for a corporation or a business in the area and you want to do something good for your community, 
um, and you want to approach them and ask them if you can help them with their trees, that's great. If you need us to help you, that's great too. We're glad to do it. We do that for a lot of corporations in the region where we'll have tree planting days either at schools or in the municipality or even arrange um, to have you do watering in the community during um, droughts and periods of problem with trees. So these really are the results that we're working on with our data set um, and how we're incorporating it into what we do. Uh, it's you know, really overall to get people to understand why trees are important. We came out with a master plan this year and we have four key goals. The first is to inspire people to value trees and it's hard to get them to value trees if they don't know what they have or why they should care. And the second is to increase the canopy because we know that the more canopy we have, the more benefits we have. The third one is to reduce threats to trees because we have low species and age diversity. And finally, the last one is to enhance our oak ecosystems because we know we're losing those in our landscape. And it's not inconceivable that within a couple of generations we just won't have oak ecosystems in our region anymore if we don't do something about it. Um, so data drives our process, which is what you guys get psyched about. And uh, I was mentioning earlier to several of you here that I'm not the data person. I have a data person um, in Indianapolis who I, would, I know would love to be here tonight and carrying uh, in-depth conversations with you all about the different models that she's developed for us and the work that she's done for us. Um, her husband's opening a distillery down there, so how dare he? They moved from here. And that's, that's our, um, this is my email. So if any of you have questions after the fact that you'd like to shoot off to me or any information, I'd be glad to provide it to you. I did bring some materials tonight, uh, some, a few things. One thing that I think you might be interested in um, is when I was talking to you about, before about the witness trees, the pre-settlement trees, some of those still exist. And so we have an interactive map that we've developed with the Field Museum. And if you go onto the interactive map, you can scroll, I'm sorry, scroll right in to see individual trees on the, um, as they were mapped. And then you can go to that location and see if you see them. And if you do, you take a photo of them, shoot it back, and we'll post it on the site. And then we'll have somebody go out and verify it. So that might be something fun for you to do. And it, there's a card here on that. Any questions for me? So um, yeah, I grew up out in the suburbs, and my mom loved her garden and described to me all the trees and plants in the garden. And I knew I, I know I've climbed many oak trees. Um, do people not like oaks because of the acorns or what's the big problem with the oaks? The problem with the oaks is that um, most people don't plant them in their yards because they're a big tree, even though they're a great tree and they can be planted in almost any yard. They also think that they grow slowly and they really don't. They'll grow a couple of feet a year. They're used to having something that grows six to eight feet in a year, which tends to be a weedy tree and it falls apart pretty quickly, like silver maple, um, box elder, some of the lower uh, lighter, uh, softer wood trees. So oaks are, just are not planted as commonly. And then the other issue is, is that they're not regenerating in the natural systems. Uh, and the reason for that is that we've had these infestations of buckthorn so that uh, smaller, uh, uh, mo sorry, smaller oak trees are not able to get started. And then they go through and they take the buckthorn out. And we've now created this canopy that has this dense canopy and oaks need light. So you'll find uh, there's actually some research going on in Lake County right now where they're creating canopy gaps. The loss of the ash trees has helped create canopy gaps because oaks need about 60% light in order to germinate and to grow to any size. We also have challenges with deer. Um, if any of you live in the suburbs, you probably have experienced lots of high populations of deer and that's also another problem. So this is a, a good segue into the Q&A section where, no, Perfect. Um, <clears throat> so there are two ways to ask a question. One is to raise your hand and the mic will be delivered. This mic will be delivered to you. I won't just take the mic out of your hand. That would be a <laughs> counterproductive way to answer questions. The other is if you'd like to ask a question anonymously uh, or without using the mic, uh, there's a section near the bottom of the agenda document where you can write questions. And there are actually three already, one of which is, what is a pirate's favorite element? Argon. Okay, but that's not part of your presentation. Um, so I'm going to jump right into one question from the doc, but if you have any other questions uh, once we get done with this one, feel free to raise your hand or drop it into the document. Um, for ash, maple, and other types of trees that are vulnerable, do you know if there are any specific recommendations for replacement tree species genera? 
So the best thing you can do is to plant broad species diversity. So if somebody, is, is, when we come out to, to meet with somebody or talk to them about trees in their community, they'll often say, I love that tree on my neighbor's property and I would, I'd love to have a tree like it. And we tell them that's the absolute wrong thing to do. You want to plant something that's completely different than what your neighbor has so that when her neighbor trees go down, you still have yours. So we don't, and we've gone through this with climate adaptation as well, because we've done a lot of work on climate adaptation and looking at our species composition with respect to climate. And we, I come back to this all the time, because people ask me this all the time, what species should I be planting? And over and over again, the only thing I can tell you is plant the broadest species diversity you can. So. I have a question. So um, you mentioned that you did a census of uh, tree counting. Is that like? a true census, like you literally counted every single tree, or did you like take like a sample of like an area and then counted the trees in that area and then like extrapolated that? We did 2,000 plots. So uh, we did 200 per county and 700 for the city of Chicago. And we're just getting, we just have our RFP out right now to repeat it again next year. So that should be coming back to us in the next week or two. But yeah, it's 2,000 plots. Uh, hi, so have you started to see changes in like what trees are growing here due to climate change or like what trees will be best adapted to the region in the future? Well, uh, we, we have had an analysis done of that. We have um, about 170 trees species that have been evaluated in the Chicago region for adaptive capacity. And that's a report that's printed on the U.S. Forest Service website. So if you're interested in it, I'd be glad to send it to you. Our biggest headache or challenge with that is, is that we'll have a winter like we had last year. So if we say, yeah, start to plant all these southern species and then we have a winter like we had last year, you lose everything. So again, we go back to planting as broad a species diversity as you can find. You will find some more southerly oriented species that seem to perform well here. And we actually have scientists at the Arboretum that collect samples from those and are producing species to test out their vulnerability to cold snaps and things like that and so that we can use those species moving forward but again it goes back to plant as broad a species diversity as you can uh, hi so i had a question about uh, buckthorn so using all this data is there any has the initiative made any plans to kind of use the data to make like a mitigation process or is the plan long term to just kind of make like survive with the buckthorn because it's too big of a problem? Like, what's using all this data now that we know how much yeah. there is out there? What's like the plan going forward? Well, um, we have a couple of things going forward. One is with the new LIDAR, um, the University of Vermont right now is looking to see if they can predict or identify where buckthorn is in the understory. So we're using that right now. Uh, we're working with Lake County Forest Preserve on that. And then uh, we actually have a program now called Healthy Hedges, and I brought some of these brochures. Um, we, we were working with the nursery industry, and we wanted them to help us uh, by tagging species in the nursery that would be appropriate replacements, and they said, nah, we won't do that. So uh, they said, if you give us a poster, we'll post a poster in our nurseries. And so uh, we have a big one of these. It's 24 by 36 or whatever that nurseries can post in there. But this is the hand size so that you as a consumer can go into your nursery and select replacement species after you've removed it. We're also working with the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association so that um, we actually have little medallions now that if you rid your property of buckthorn, you get one of these little medallions that you can put on your conservation at home sign or you can put it on your window that says um, buckthorn free zone and uh, it goes along with the Healthy Hedges campaign. So we have a couple of other brochures like this that give you species to select from because people don't realize it's a bad thing. It's bad for the birds. It keeps salamanders and other animals from being able to uh, gestate appropriately or they become deformed because of the chemicals from buckthorn. So it's a real problem for us. So we're trying to push people to eradicate it on their properties. And when I showed you those maps before the oaks and we have the buffers around them, we're really focused on getting, we have one priority core area in each county where the public landowner is working with the private landowner to eradicate buckthorn on their property so that it doesn't feed into these conservation areas. And it's a, it's a campaign that we're just getting off the ground. Okay. Hi. Um, I feel like a lot of tree decisions 
turn into big community arguments and yeah. uh, you know this factor competing with that so I had a couple two-parter related to mm -hmm. that one is you've talked about um, oak tree ecosystem mm -hmm. but also we have to really increase diversity so mm -hmm. those seem like competing goals either we restore yeah. the oaks or diversity and the second part is in my community we started a big fight over save some cottonwoods oh. in, instead yeah. of cutting them down for a stormwater project or like spending millions to avoid cutting them down so mm -hmm. like are cottonwoods really that great a tree? Well, cottonwoods take up a tremendous amount of water. So if you, if you, there's a thing on the uh, internet that you can go to called the National Tree Benefit Calculator. And if you put in a cottonwood and you put in the diameter of it, you'll see that's one of the species, that and silver maple are a couple of the best species for pulling up water out of the soil. So if you have flooding issues, they're a great tree for that. The Army Corps of Engineers now is allocating uh, credits for tree planting, which they used to not do because of the benefits that trees provide. So um, cottonwoods are, are good. If you have other species that you can plant, they tend to be very soft uh, wood. They're short-lived and they um, have problems with, during storm events. So that's a challenge if you don't want to have them coming down. A lot of people um, think that trees live forever and they don't live forever. They have sort of a lifespan of when they should be removed, and so it's every community has to make those decisions for themselves. And I know people get very attached to their big trees, so it can be problematic at times. Um, the other question you asked me was about species diversity and how it appears to be combating the oak ecosystem recovery. So we're not saying that you only plant oaks. Uh, when we talk about oak ecosystems, we're talking about a complement of species that grow within oak ecosystems. I'm also not saying you can't plant ginkgo or other species that are not native to our area because we know we need broad species diversity. But what we are saying is that we're in, for instance, we're in the Mississippi Flyway where birds are migrating across the globe and they go through our, our area. And they look down as they're flying over and they say, oh, there's a McDonald's and they pull off and land on an oak tree. And what they do is their uh, oak trees support about 500 different species of wildlife, insects and other things. So the birds know to stop, find oak trees because that's where they're going to find the insects and the other things that they thrive on. And they eat those animals or those little insects and then they fly across Lake Michigan en route to wherever they're going next. And so we need to have opportunities for that wildlife to have places to to go. So we tell people that if you have an oak on your property or a hackberry or a uh, shagbark hickory or a cherry, any of these that are natively occurring within the oak ecosystem, that's great. But that doesn't have to be the only species you plant. Hey, I, I was just wondering, um, when you're talking about canopy, mm -hmm. if you're, um, is there any difference in looking at a canopy that is a, trees that are within a, where, where people are actually living versus canopies that are in designated areas for, um, you know, a wildlife sort of um, areas? And then, um, and when you're looking at, uh, when you're selling it to the community, mm -hmm. is there a difference on the value that, that uh, a canopy that is actually, you know, along like the avenues and stuff, trees there versus the benefits of a, of a sort of a wildlife area? So they, they both have uh, different functions, and so you have to look at them from a functional standpoint. Um, when they're within their own uh, ecosystem, say like oak ecosystems, uh, they, they grow in a suite of species that are uh, symbiotic. When you plant individual street, trees on a street or in your yard, there often isn't a symbiotic uh, process going on. So when they're in their own ecosystem and they're growing in a symbiotic way, it's much healthier than when it's in an urban area. The reality is, is that we can't have those kinds of ecosystems along a street as effectively. You're going to have all the salt spray from cars. I mean, if we lived in a, a healthier way, we wouldn't have that problem. But you've got salt spray from cars. You've got pollution running off the roads from uh, cars that come by or other problems like that that make some species very hard to grow in streets, along streets, or in corridors, or even in downtown Chicago. Um, so the benefits they provide don't change because of where they're planted. They can grow bigger and they can be healthier in a healthy ecosystem, so then they can provide more benefits. But it doesn't, it doesn't diminish um, their value because of where they're planted. Does that make sense? I may not have explained that correctly. So we've got time for one more question. 
Um, and I'm kind of bummed, too, because there are two really good questions in the doc. But we've got one more in person, and then we're going to move on to the next section. Oh, is it me? It's me. Um, my question is uh, kind of just, it was another canopy question. It was kind of, uh, I was going to ask about the fact that the city has a, a long backlog of tree requests, and if the initiative has any ability to help influence funding for that. And kind of along with that, maybe a better question to answer would be, um, we've talked a lot about like property owners, but mm -hmm. there's a large portion, I would guess, especially in these neighborhoods that have less coverage where people rent. So if we mm -hmm. rent or if we're just like regular citizens, like what, what can we do? So um, the first question you asked me was about the city of Chicago. Um, we actually go after funding through the U.S. Forest Service. We've been trying to get the city of Chicago to work with us throughout the Emanuel administration. <clears throat> We're hoping that uh, the new Mayor Lightfoot will be more receptive and be more willing to work with us. Um, trees have not been a focus since Daly went out of office, and we're hoping that that will change. Um, in the meantime, what we've been doing is we've been going after funding from the U.S. Forest Service to get funding for the city of Chicago to plant trees, and we've just submitted a proposal to plant in five neighborhoods. We're waiting to hear back from that. We planted in two neighborhoods last year, and every year we have some planting that we do within a specific neighborhood, and we have a very close relationship with the Department of Forestry. They're on board with what we're trying to do. Um, sometimes we'll get calls and ask to come out and meet with Water Department and other folks that are planning to cut down trees is, is happening a lot. Um, we've got all the lead in the water pipes that's gonna be a huge problem when they start replacing those because right now they don't value the benefits that trees provide, so they just cut all the trees down and start over. So that's something that we're working on. The question about uh, being a, a renter there are all kinds of volunteer opportunities around trees in the Chicago region. So please don't feel like you can't do something to help support urban forestry. One of the first things you can do is contact the owner of your apartment complex and ask him if they won't allow to have some trees planted on their property. If they will, we can work with you to help try to figure out a way to get some funding for you to do that. Or if they're willing to pay for it, we're willing to come out and show people how to do it and get the trees in the ground and get them cared for. The uh, Community Tree Champions Program and Tree Keepers are great ways, and all of the forest preserves in the district, or in the seven county region, have very intensive buckthorn removal programs and uh, monitoring protocols that they need help with. And you all are all data geeks, and everybody, everywhere I know, needs somebody with your expertise and your talent to help, because I can't do it, and I know what I need to explain something, but I have to rely on somebody as bright and talented as you are to be able to get that information to me so that I can use it. So be thinking about how you can use your skill set, I guess. Thank you very much.